Okay. Okay. So the title of my message is Yoked with Christ. And thank you, Roshan, for reading uh, the scripture uh, portion for us. Uh, thank you so very much. And what is, what is a yoke? You all know very well. But the definition for yoke is, yoke is a wooden piece that is fastened over the neck or necks of one or more, more than one animals and attached to plow or cart uh, uh, so that they may pull. Sometimes these yokes uh, may not be purpose uh, may not be used only for carting and plowing, but sometimes certain yokes are put on uh, uh, animals to slow them down. And if there are any animals which are strong, and for the man who is looking after them, if it's difficult for them to uh, catch, then they put. I have seen in villages they put. Uh, uh, they take a log, little heavy log, and put it. Uh, they tie it on the neck so that the animal may not run fast and be mischievous. So to get control, uh, they use uh, these also. Yesterday, we, as we were driving back from uh, uh, Yavatmal, we, we were, uh, we, I mean, we, uh, our, we were uh, slowed down because of uh, uh, some hundreds of uh, oxes. I mean, the... Um, People who were taking care of the oxes and they were taking them to uh, they're taking them from one place to another. It seems so. What they did was uh, they tied two oxes together so that they may not run fast and they may slow down and they can have more control. So when something is tied up, it controls. When something is tied up, uh, it puts them on in a particular line. They don't leave the flock and run away. Go. They cannot go wherever they want to go, but their life, uh, their walk will be on a particular track. So that's something we can uh, notice about yokes. Uh, the word yoke is also used metaphorically for something that is oppressive and burdensome, like uh, the feudalism we can see in the history, how is, Telugu people can relate to the Jamindaris and uh, imperialism. We all have the history of imperialism, how uh, people were being um, uh, oppressed under these powerful and sometimes uh, uh, psychopathic kings who tortured and who tra who uh, who executed mass uh, murders as well and a yoke that all of us are bearing and which we find it which we will be struggling uh, every year and every day of our life is taxation so we, we know taxes also are uh, you know uh, are like a yoke or burden to us uh, I was looking to purchase a vehicle, so I've seen the kind of taxes there. We are the amount of tax we were paying, so that made me realize how difficult it is for people like us you know, to pay those uh, taxes. Of course, I'm not saying we should not pay taxes, we should be paying taxes. Uh, sometimes we find that the taxes that we will be paying uh, are like a, a burden to us, are like a uh, yoke to us. And last week, we have we all heard how. Uh, hilariously, Joshua explained about the yoke uh, of marriage. And marriage is not that easy. <laughs> she shared uh, so many examples and all how it is very difficult and uh, uh, how burdensome it is to um, uh, continue the marriage and um, to move forward uh, in the lives. So the metaphorical meaning of the yoke always speaks about some kind of burden that we all uh, experience. I hope uh, my wife will be have okay. I don't mean all my words. Uh, so those are just fun note. Uh, so another word uh, or my meaning for this metaphor is um, being linked or chained together by a contract, like in a marriage or any business deal. Basically, the word yoke, it has this Indo-European background, if you go to the etymology of the word. In most of the Indian and European, in Asian and European languages, the word yoke is, uh, sounds almost similar. Okay. Uh, in uh, European word, it's, it's yukom. And uh, 
the which is taken from the roots of yog and some said even the word yoga which we are hearing it is also taken from this word which uh, they be in the ancient um, uh, beliefs they believe that uh, through yoga humans are connecting to the divine uh, that is the word that is the reason they introduced this word yoga so the word yoga yoga and all the all these things have come from one background which says uh, uh, linked together or paid together or tied together so this is the meaning of uh, uh, the word yoke and these are the metaphors uh, we see people uh, so these are the this is these are the metaphorical meanings of the word yoke and bible also uses uh, this word yoke uh, metaphorically in various places in terms of uh, your burden in terms of uh, your, you know your oppression the word yoke was used and uh, there were very in various places in bible the same word was used to explain the same uh, that is in deuteronomy 28 verse uh, 48 where it says therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the lord will send against you in hunger in thirst in nakedness and in need of everything and he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he destroy until he has destroyed you see here we can see it is about a kind of uh, oppression it is a kind of suppression or it is a kind of uh, a burden that slows people down and a burden that controls them uh, a, a burden that they suffer they struggle in that sense the word yoke has been used uh, especially talking about the oppression and the word yoke also used as uh, in terms of difficulty especially um, like taxes like in five, we can read it in first first kings chapter 12 verse 10 to 11 uh, this is uh, rehobam who took after the death of solomon and he was talking to his young men and this is the discussion then the young men who had uh, so the people came to uh, rehobam and said your father solomon taxed us so much and it which was very difficult for us and now you came into the power so why don't you ease us ease some taxes so that we can be relaxed a little then uh, rehobam calls his advisors and uh, they have the discussion then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him saying thus you should speak to the people who have spoken to you saying your father made your made our yoke heavy but you make it lighter on us thus you shall say to them my little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist and now uh, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you i will add to your yoke my father chastised you with whips uh, but i will chastise you with uh, scorches so king solomon he put taxes which was like a yoke for the people they wanted to get, find some kind of rest and king rehobam he says i'm going to put much more yoke on you much more trouble to you so in this sense metaphorically the word yoke has been used as a burden at the same time when we come to the new testament the word yoke also used in several places and uh, especially we can read it in matthew chapter uh, verse 27 to 30 that scripture portion which roshan led and we all know that jesus has come here to set people free to give uh, freedom and uh, announce he came to announce the liberation healing to the sick and uh, liberation to the people who are prisoned uh, he he is the great liberator and the long waited messiah of king uh, long waited messiah of israel and he told people in matthew 11:27 uh, he says all things have been delivered to me by my father and no one knows the son except the father not as anyone knows the father except the son and the one to whom the son wills to reveal him come to me all who uh, sorry come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden i will give you rest till this it is very good for us and we all christians use this word very much and everywhere uh, sometimes on the uh, vehicle sometimes on the buildings on walls uh, we find these words Uh, saying like jesus said come to me all who have uh, all who are labor and have heavy laden and i will give you rest so but we don't read the next portion of uh, the scripture which says take my yoke upon you and learn uh, and learn from me 
I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Oh, Jesus came here and said he is giving freedom to us. He came to liberate us uh, and he said, come to me all who labor and have heavy laden, I will give you rest. And then it is surprising for us to see that Jesus is saying, you take my yoke. You give me your yoke, you give me your burden, I'm going to set you free from that. And uh, he's, he's not leaving there, but he is calling us to take his yoke upon us. What is this yoke? Is this the yoke like the taxes Rehoboam raised? Is this the yoke like the foreigners who suppressed uh, the nation of Israel in Jutra, nation of Israel in the Old Testament? What is this yoke? Have you ever thought about it? Jesus said, take my yoke. And you and me, we are called to take the yoke of Jesus. What is this? Some say this yoke is the Torah or the Old Testament laws. Or you can say the Ten Commandments and 613 regulations. So we all were, uh, we were, we all were weary and we came to Jesus and he gave, gave us the rest. We believe in Jesus and we found our salvation. Now, as we live in this life, we need to be obeying the law and the commandments of the Lord in the Old Testament. That is what, that's what people say. Jesus is calling us to take the yoke. The yoke is nothing but the law. That's what they say. Is it so? If it is so, what is this? Uh, Apostle Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. He says, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And uh, 320, he says, If anyone can be, uh, the, I mean, uh, can be justified by the works of the law, then Christ came for nothing. So if we can obey the law, then there is no point in Jesus coming and dying on the cross. We all are not able to obey the law. None of us can obey the law completely. Because in Deuteronomy 18, it is written, if we break one single commandment, we broke the entire, entire law. So we may say, Oh, I'm not breaking, I'm not lying, I'm not, uh, uh, sorry, I'm not the stealing, I'm not doing murder, I'm not coveting anything uh, any, that belongs to anyone. Uh, I'm obeying, uh, sorry, I'm uh, attending the church or keeping my Sabbath or uh, giving my tithe, all these things we may check. And uh, what about lying? Sometimes very small things, we lie. We will be going somewhere and somebody stops and asks, uh, hello, hey, hey friend, where are you going? What do we answer most of the time? Eh, nowhere. If you're going nowhere, why are you on the road? Huh? For small, small things, sometimes we lie. So we are not keeping the Ten Commandments. We are not able to do that. So how many of the young people like to wear jeans? We all like to wear jeans, right? Or we all like the new clothes. According to the Old Testament, you should not wear any uh, uh, any cloth any cloth or any garment that has uh, mixed fabrics. But all of us are wearing all mixed fabrics fabrics only. So it is impossible for us to keep the law. These are just funny examples I'm bringing to uh, your no your notice. That's all. But it is impossible to keep the law. That is the very reason Jesus came and fulfilled the law on our behalf. And that is the same thing Apostle Paul writes, uh, sorry, Apostle Paul speaks um, in Acts chapter 15 and Luke writes, uh, Acts 15 verse 10. We all are very much aware of this because we were discussing about Jerusalem Council since couple of weeks, since three weeks. So uh, Apostle Paul speaks, now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. He's talking about the law. We were also not able to bear. Our forefathers were not able to bear. And why do you want to put that same yoke on new believers or new, uh, new Christians? And people say, we have to obey the law. So I would like, uh, uh, we, we should reconsider uh, uh, 
whether we can obey the law or not. According to, the, according to Paul, none of us can obey the law and he doesn't want that we should put the yoke of the law on people. If the yoke is the law, then what about this? Does Bible contradict itself? No. So one thing we can clearly understand from this, that uh, that is when Jesus said, take my yoke, he doesn't mean the law. It is not about the law. Then what is the law? And some people say, uh, sorry, what is the yoke? And some people say, uh, the yoke is a new law that is developed by Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. We all read the Sermon on the, we all read the, Sermon on the Mount where Jesus spoke about various moral, ethical issues and various spiritual matters also he spoke. And people say uh, one of the greatest sermons in the world are the Sermon on the Mount or great, one of the greatest sermons we find in the Bible also is Sermon on the Mount. Okay, uh, so they say uh, the yoke Jesus is, Jesus is calling us is the law that Jesus developed in his sermon that is Sermon on the Mount. And in fact, the reality is Jesus raised the bars of obedience in the Sermon on the Mount. If Old Testament speaks about some standards of living, ethical and moral living, and Jesus raised the bar even higher. Old Testament, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus says, if you have looked at a woman with a lustful eye, you have already committed adultery. And according to Jesus, and sermon, according to the Sermon on the Mount, uh, if you call your brother rascal or fool, sorry, if you call somebody fool, then we, we, we ought to go to hell. We are liable to receive the punishment of hell for calling somebody fool. Now, let us imagine, did any of us call somebody fool? Do we call? Every day we call something in a, some or other situation, we call somebody fool. <laughs> you know, Jesus raised the standards. Okay. He said, you shall not even look at a woman lustful eyes. If you look at a woman with lustful eyes, you have already committed a woman. If we are not able to even reach to the standards of the law, then how can we reach to the standards that are spoken in the Sermon on the Mount? If somebody who was not able to jump three feet, will you put a bar of seven feet in front of him to jump? That is foolish. Oh, uh, for calling foolish, I hope I won't go to hell. Huh? So definitely one thing we understand from this, that it is not talking, uh, this yoke is not talking about the new law that is developed by Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. And let me tell you the truth. Sermon on the Mount is not given so that we may obey it and become righteous and be acceptable to God. But Sermon on the Mount was given so that we may realize we are utterly corrupt within. We are not able to keep, keep the law. We are not able to be acceptable or, or become righteous by our deeds. And we need to put our faith in Jesus. We need a savior. We may come to that conclusion. Let me repeat. Sermon on the Mount is not given so that we may obey it and become righteous and be acceptable to God. But it is given so that we may realize we cannot obey the law. We are totally corrupt from within and we need a savior and we may come to the foot of Jesus in faith so that we may be saved. That is the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, so one thing we can clearly understand from this. So this yoke is not even the Sermon on the Mount or the new law that's developed in the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, and some say, some others say this yoke is about the greatest commandments. What are the greatest commandments? We just heard we, uh, in the service opener. The greatest commandments are loving God and loving our neighbor. Okay. And uh, we all want to love, love the Lord. Are we truly able to keep, keep these two commandments? Are we able to love the Lord? And it does not end there. He says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. If you are thinking about football game, 
So you are not loving the Lord because you have already given some part of your mind <laughs> to football. And if you are, if you, if you like something, you I like biryani. I love to eat it. So I'm not loving the Lord because my heart is on biryani now. Okay. And what about this worshiping the Lord? We come to the church. Are we able to focus for the, the um, uh, one hour of service completely without any divided attention? Uh, sorry, were we able to give God the undivided attention with all our mind and with all our strength? Are we able to do it? No, we are not able to do it. We cannot love the Lord with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. And sometimes we struggle when we give our tithes. I may not be able to give 10% this time. I may be able to give only 7%. You know, are we loving the Lord with everything that we have? I'm not judging people. I'm just trying to present how in, uh, inadequate we are to keep this. We are not able to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, and soul. And are we able to love our neighbors as ourselves? And we know, you know, the people who are throwing leaves from the next house, you know, in front of our gate or door, you know, how difficult it is for us. It is very difficult sometimes to uh, love people. And in fact, we, we find it very difficult. Some, some said the most uh, uh, difficult thing um, uh, in marriage, for, especially for men, is to keep loving their spouses. So we have difficulties and we are struggling in that uh, very reality. So are we able to love our neighbors as ourselves? It is difficult. And in fact, the reality is we are not able to love our, love our neighbors as ourselves because most of the times we don't love ourselves. If we love ourselves, we, at least we may be able to try. We don't love ourselves. That's why we are not able to love others also. And the, the person whom we hate the most in our lives, most of the times, so for most of the people, it would be themselves. It's very difficult to love ourselves. It's very difficult to accept ourselves. That's why we are not able to love others. So we understand. We are not able to keep this. If it is so, are we able to bear this yoke? Are we able to love the Lord with all our heart, mind and soul and love our neighbor as ourselves? No, we are not able to. So this yoke does not mean the greatest commandments. What is this yoke then? To understand this, we need to look at the same portion of the scripture closely. The, uh, the key to understand is this, what Jesus said before these words. Number one thing he said, come to me, uh, sorry, no one knows the father except the son. And then no one knows the son except the father. Keep it in your mind. And next thing he said, come to me, I will give you rest and take my yoke upon you. He's not asking us to take any yoke. He's asking us to take his yoke. In other words, he's asking us to be co-yoked with him. He's asking us, it, this is not a yoke for one animal which we put, but this is a yoke that is used for, uh, for two animals like co-yoked. So that is the reason the title of my sermon also is Yoked with Jesus or yoked with Christ. He is asking us to share his yoke. So what is his yoke? What is this yoke? What is the yoke that Jesus was carrying? Do you think the yoke Jesus was carrying can be the law? Do you think the yoke Jesus would be carrying is the law in the Sermon on the Mount? The yoke, uh, the yoke he is carrying is the great commandments? No. The answer is just spoken a words before that. That is, no one knows the Father except the Son. No one knows the Son except the Father. The yoke Jesus was carrying is his very relationship with his Father and the Spirit. And he is asking us to be co-yoked with him. Why am I saying taking this um, sense because 
the word yoke metaphorically also used as unite or join together or link together the bible uses uh, bible uses uh, the word yoke in this sense we find it in second corinthians chapter 16 6 verse 14 where apostle paul was speaking about marriage and said do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers the marriage it is a relational yoke okay that is the reason we need to look at this yoke relationally. And our God whom we are worshipping is Father, Son and the Holy Spirit who is a relational God and the same thing Jesus mentioned. No one knows the Father except the Son and no one knows the Son except the Father. And now you come to me. I will give you rest and you be core. You, you take my yoke. Be, become my partner in this yoke. In other words, become my partner in relationship with, Jesus, with Father and the Son. He wants us uh, to share with us his relationship that he has with his father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus comes to free us. Sorry, Jesus, uh, Jesus comes to free us and freed us for what? He freed us for adoption. So that we may become his real brothers and sisters in his relationship with the father. That's why it is written in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, verse 3 onwards, blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, just as he chose us in him, holy and blameless, to be his children uh, in him, uh, to be his children without any blemish. And John chapter 1 verse 12, what it says, whosoever believed in him, he had given the right to become the children of God. So when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are becoming the children of God. Jesus is sharing his relationship with us. He is adopting us. Apostle Paul uses the word adoption. We are adopted into the family of God through Jesus Christ uh, incarnation. And uh, this is example I uh, gave, sh shared several times, but I would like to share again. If you look at Jesus uh, at childhood when he missed uh, his pay, I mean, missed from his parents in Jerusalem, and the parents came to him and asked, "What are you doing, sir? Where are you, son? We were worried about you." What did Jesus answer? Don't you know that I'm in my father's business? He said, and in the Sermon on the Mount, as he was talking about fasting, and he said, "Go shut your doors, and pray in see, uh, pray uh, in your room. Your father, who listens to you in person." Will reveal you, so will our reward you openly. Whose father? He says, Your father. And thirdly, he taught us the great um, Lord's Prayer, where he asked all of us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven. Look at the progression. My father, your father, our father. Is it not talking about that option? Because of Jesus Christ, we have one father. As Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, we are calling uh, because of the work of the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8, the Spirit uh, prays within our spirit calling Abba, Father. Holy Spirit also is working in our life so that we can call God as Father. It is talking about being adopted into the family of God and being brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. Jesus is sharing his relationship with us. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are co-lovers with God. Now, the commandments make sense. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now, it be they make sense. In Jesus, we are the co-lovers uh, of God. Uh, we are created and redeemed to enter into the love uh, into the love each person of the trinity has for each other so father loves the son son loves the father they love each other in the spirit now since we are sharing the yoke of jesus father, since father loves the son and we are loving the father along with jesus and son loves the father so we are lo loving the son along with the father and we love the Holy Spirit in the same way. So it is uh, loving the Father and the Spirit with the love that we, it is not about the love 
that we have um, uh, for God. It is about loving the Father and the Son as Jesus is loving them. Jesus gave a new gave the new commandment where he said, um, "Love one another as I have loved you." Right. Uh, most of the times we take these words uh, uh, in this sense. Uh, we need to love God, love others as in the same pattern or in the same amount that Jesus loved us. But Jesus is saying that, but that is not Jesus was telling. Love one another as I have loved you. Oh, sorry, as uh, as I have loved you means um, this has to be taken like as Jesus is loving. Oh, sorry. Uh, I went to my second point, but the same principle applies here. Jesus is telling, "Love one another as I have loved you." Means, I am loving for example, for I am I am loving some so X person. So now you join me, and you also love him. Do I make sense? It is not. Jesus is not saying, "As much as I am loving you, you love him." He is saying, "I am loving somebody." and you join me as i am loving him in which you also love along with jesus the same pattern continues as to talk if you say about our love towards the father as the son is loving the father we are not able to love the father by ourselves what we do is we are co-yoked with christ now as son is loving the father we also join him in loving him as the father is loving the son we join the father in loving jesus and the spirit and the same way about the worship also we are co lovers with god uh, of god in loving god and the same way we are co worshipers with jesus okay um, jesus is our worship leader he is leading us in worshiping the father the hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 to 12 it says for it is fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he he who sanctified and those who are being sanctified all are one for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren saying i will declare your name to my brethren and in the midst of the assembly i will sing praise to you here jesus is singing praise to the father and he is calling us co brothers with him in doing that we uh, we read the verse uh, from john a true worshipper will will worship the lord in truth and in spirit why are we worshiping in spirit because we are the co worshipers with the spirit as jesus is worshiping the lord we are joining him and offering our worship as spirit is worshiping the father we are joining him and worshiping the father and the son the father draws near to us to draw us near to himself so that we can praise the son the way he does the son draws near to us to draw us near to him so that we can worship the father the way he does and the way and similarly the holy spirit the spirit comes to uh, comes upon us to fill us with his passion to see the father and the son glorified the spirit gives us the entry into the trinitarian delight there is a uh, yeah, joyous conversation a joyful adoration and worship is going in between father son and the holy spirit the holy spirit uh, glorifies the son son glorifies the father father glorifies the son and it is like hot potato game um, so the worship is going in between the persons of the trinity now the holy spirit is drawing us into that worship it is not that we are saying god hallelujah and you are great and you are sitting on a high chair no there is already a worship is going in the trinity and we are called to participate with him have you ever got this thought i have struggled quite a bit uh, thinking about am i worshiping the lord correctly are we worshiping the lord correctly hmm? do you think your worship is acceptable to god 
the songs they are singing are they really worshiping the lord or that's just simply some songs where we feel energized by the so called positive thinking uh, positive thinking that we get again uh, from the faith the words filled with faith or our worship is just an emotional move where we when we focus on the hope that god has given us we feel good and happy then we say uh, we feel we say that is the worship sometimes people come and say today's worship was good brother and today's worship is not that great so there was some disturbance so there was no great worship is it something you are feeling the worship is something what you feel where you had grand music and you felt some kind of emotional connection and touch so that is the worship the true worship is not about any of this the true worship is that happens in between father son and the holy spirit where the father love where the holy spirit glorifies the son son glorifies the father they don't feel selfish to keep their worship to among to themselves but they are sharing the, the glory and worship amongst themselves and we are joining them in the spirit because we are co-yoked with jesus christ that is where we are joining we are worshiping i would like to like to read this uh, uh, sentence again the father draws near to us to uh, to draw us near to himself so that we can praise the son the way he does the son draws near to us to draw us near to himself so that he can worship the father the way he does the spirit the spirit comes upon us to fill us with his passion to see the father and the son glorified the spirit gives us entry into the uh, inner trinitarian delight that is what christian worship is all about so now since i am joining jesus i don't need to be worried about worried whether my worship is acceptable to god or not since i am co worshipper with jesus co yoked with jesus i am not scared now whether uh, my worship uh, is the right way of worship or not because this worship is not mine this worship is jesus is doing and i am joining him so we don't need to be worried now if we are able to worship the father son and the holy spirit in the way uh, in a, sorry in a worthy manner because we join the holy spirit as the father uh, sorry as he offers the worship to the son and the father and we join the father as he offers worship to the son and the spirit and we join the son as he worships the father and the son so now we don't need to be worried about worship worship whether we are doing it rightly or not because we are co yoked with jesus we are yoked with jesus faith are we having the right faith proper faith correct faith i am faithless these are the words we'll be thinking about uh, you know in spite of all these years of uh, life into ministry and studying in scripture sometimes i feel am i believing god am i believing just my faith sometimes am i believing god or am i believing my education or uh, uh, my knowledge sometimes i feel that that's where i depend on the lord and i pray to him and depend on the faith of jesus christ it's not about my faith it is about faith of jesus where i am joining him in his faith the father trust the son so much that he gave the weight of the grand a uh, plan a grand work and grand mission of this salvation and the son trust the father so much that he went to the cross knowing it was uh, it was the right way it is the way that he the father wants us, wants him to uh, accomplish the salvation of humanity and father draws near to me to draw uh, sorry the and the father draws uh, near to me as i drew as i as i come close to jesus in trust in the son and the son draws near to me as i come close to the father putting my trust in jesus in the father so when we believe in jesus also when we believe in the father also we are co-yoked with the trinity galatians chapter 3 verse 20 says i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me the life which i i now live in the flesh i live by the faith of the son of god according to kjv it is not faith 
faith in the Son of God. When you say faith in the Son of God, it is focusing on us, my faith in the Son of God. But I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. How can I live by the faith of the Son of God? I can live by the faith of the Son of God because I am yoked with Christ. I'm sharing the same yoke of faith with Christ. I'm sharing the same yoke of love with Christ. I'm sharing the same yoke of relationship with Christ. And what about loving our neighbors? John chapter 13 verse 34 says, A new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So, um, uh, so here Jesus is saying, love one another as I have loved you. As I explained before, Jesus is telling us to join him as his loving people, as co-lovers. We are not commanded to love others as much as God loves, which is impossible. We are called to join God in loving others as he is loving them. The closer we get uh, to, uh, the closer we get uh, to the heart of God, we get closer to what is uh, in the heart of God. And we find what is in the heart of God. Nothing but his precious creature, uh, creation, the humans. So when we know that our neighbor is in the heart of God and we drew close to the heart of God, what would happen? we would also love them as God is already loving them. It is not, let me repeat again, we are not called to live just as Jesus loved others. He, we are called to join Jesus as Jesus is loving them. We are co-lovers with God. What about evangelism? First John chapter 1 verse 2 verse 3. This is also says the same thing. And here John writes, The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us that which was, sorry, which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. Uh, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son Jesus Christ. Look at this. He is talking. He, Jesus, Apostle John, he is evangelizing through these words. In fact, and he is calling people to join him as he is already joined the fellowship with the Father and the Son. That is the evangelism. Our evangelism is not we need to go and save the dying world. Our evangelism is we have already joined the fellowship with the Father and the Son, and we ask them. Come along with me. As Jesus said, share my, take my yoke and it is light. Now we come and tell people, share my joy and it is wonderful. Come and join the fellowship. That is the evangelism that we do. And Jesus did the same. Jesus called uh, him first, the father, his father. Then he called, he is your father. And he said, he is our father. He joined, he called us into that relationship. And uh, evangelism is the same. As John says, he's already part of the fellowship and he's asking us to join the fellowship. And we are part of this fellowship and we need to call people to join the fellowship so that we may celebrate the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And they too may just share, they may have, they may share in our joy. So, and it is not, uh, so evangelism is an invitation to join us as we have fellowship with the Father and the Son, the same thing uh, Apostle John wrote here. And in fact, if we are excited about our fellowship with God, we cannot stop inviting people into it. If we are not able to invite people into the fellowship, probably we need to check, are we able to realize our fellowship with the Father or with God? Are we truly experiencing the fellowship? If you are not truly experiencing the fellowship, we know we won't be able to realize the ex excitement of the fellowship. When we could not experience the excitement of the fellowship, we will not be excited to invite people into that fellowship. So evangelism is not about 
changing people's perspective or changing people's religion or way of life or lifestyle patterns, the way they work and all, or dressing. Evangelism is, I'm having a party with Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. It is so wonderful. Come on, brother, you too can join us. That is evangelism. The same thing Jesus did. So in conclusion, what is taking the yoke of Jesus? Taking the yoke of Jesus is relational in its nature. It is sharing his relationship with the Trinity. And it is sharing his relationship with the world. And this yoke is easy. Because we are not carrying it by ourselves. It is because with whom are we carrying it? We are accomplishing it because Jesus is already accomplishing it and we join him. So uh, this, in this, when we take the yoke of Jesus, we will be able to worship the Lord the way the Son worships the Father and the Spirit and Spirit worships the Son and the Father and the way Father worships the Son and the Spirit. And we will be able to love the same way. We will be able to trust the same way. And we will be able to love others also the same way. As Jesus is loving the world, we will be joining Jesus and loving the world. The great disciplines of uh, Christian life are worship, community, and mission. And they are grounded in Trinity. We are co-lovers with God. Of God, uh, sorry, we are co-lovers with God, which is talking about worship. We are co-lovers with God of one another, so in which we will be loving one another, which is talking about the community. We are co-lovers with God of the world, uh, in which we will be loving and sharing the message of his love, which is our mission and which is evangelism. So in the Trinitarian, in this threefold uh, life, as we become the co uh, partners with Christ, co-yoked with Christ, we will be able to do worship. We will be able to uh, build, live in a community and we will be able to do our mission and evangelism. And without that, we will not be able to do any of this. Without being yoked with Jesus Christ, we cannot even worship God. We cannot even have a Christian community to say and we cannot do evangelism. So... As Jesus said, come to me all who labor and have heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke and uh, it is easy. And uh, I would like to encourage brethren to focus more on Jesus as we are yoked with him and uh, to accomplish everything that Jesus is the one who yoked with us. Thank you.